Today, we're talking about Mark Cuban's greatest mistake, the one decision above all others he believes may have cost Dallas multiple championships. It's probably the most controversial move the Mavericks ever made under Mark Cuban, and today we're going to break that down, that being the decision to let this guy, my hand is not in front of the graphic, but this guy, Steve Nash, walk away in free agency in July of 2004. There are a lot of things to consider for this particular what if, and I've referenced this and kind of alluded to doing this video for some time, and really the only reason I haven't already published it is because the more I kept coming back and recording things, the more I realized there was more variant factors to consider here. Because if Steve Nash leaves your team, that means the guys who then came into your team and within two years put you in the finals are not a part of that team because that money is allocated elsewhere. Likewise, the Phoenix Suns, who then rose up to being one of the best teams in the NBA and the most exciting offense in the league at the time, they don't elevate to that level either. So it becomes a very much hodgepodge of different factors, and it's difficult to get a concrete answer, but what we can do is analyze what we know. So without further ado, let's take a look at that. Steve Nash's best season in Dallas was actually his age 27 season in the 2001-2002 season. In that season, he averaged 17.9 points per game, 7.7 .7 assists, 3.1 rebounds on 48.3% shooting from the field, 45.5% shooting from beyond the arc, and 88.7% at the charity stripe. All of this gave him a true effective field goal percentage of 55.4%. This statistically was actually his best season in Dallas, although his last two seasons in Dallas had actually regressed a little bit for the most part. His points per game went down from 17.7 to 17.1, then down to 15.5, I want to say, in his final season in Dallas. And the only thing that changed was in his last season in Dallas, the season with Anton Walker, or excuse me, Anton Jameson and Antoine Walker, he averaged eight, a career high assist there at over eight per game. Eight career high at the time, I should say, during his career with Dallas in his first two seasons with Phoenix when he was drafted by them. But regardless, because of his ongoing back issues, which Steve Nash notorious for when he was checked out of the game, laying flat on his back on the floor with his head basically propped up on a pillow, watching the action. Very weird visual, but Mark Cuban looked at all this and said, hey, this guy's 30 years old, about to be 30 years old, and he's getting a big money deal here for a team that he's regressed in his play the last couple of years. Now, you could definitely say his final season with Dallas that was a bit of a Frankenstein's monster that Mark Cuban tried to put together. He tried to add as much firepower as he could, but having Dirk in his prime, really just entering his prime, mixed with Anton Jameson and Anton Walker, you had three guys who played the four, all of which at a very good level, Dirk at a great level, but it kind of le led to a log jam, and Dallas just didn't have the balance it needed to do anything, hence them getting bounced in five games against the Sacramento Kings in the first round that year. Now, in that, Dallas decided they had to reevaluate how they were managing the team, and the big decision that they make, obviously, is they painfully lowball Steve Nash. Sounds like they basically offered about a third of what Phoenix was offering. Dallas offered something like a three-year deal worth like, tw or something to that effect, worth $25 million, roughly, whereas Phoenix was willing to go five for 65 with a team option for a sixth year. And that obviously was the best offer for Nash. He wanted to stay in Dallas, said he wanted to finish his career here, but it just became clear that he wasn't going to get that opportunity from Mark. So he goes back to Phoenix, we know what happens there. He wins two straight MVPs. And his first year in Phoenix, his son's team bounced the Mavericks in the second round in six games. And that is a painful memory because it's the first year without one of your favorite, if you're like me, one of your favorite Mavericks of all time. I put him right behind Dirk in terms of my favorite players. 
and watching him win the MVP elsewhere and bounce us from the playoffs as he then heads back to the Western Conference Finals, where we felt like going into the previous year, we were destined to get back to that point because we had been so close the year before that to then have that disappointment and then watch Nash go back to the Western Conference Finals without us was incredibly disheartening. But that's the way it worked out. And then, oh, look, the very next year, another MVP. Son of a bitch. So there's a couple things to consider here. That Suns roster was actually quite stacked. Quite stacked indeed. In addition to having the MVP Steve Nash, you had a young emerging Amari Stoudemire. You had Sean Marion, who was really really just a Swiss army knife out there. Great slasher, great versatile defender. Uh, you had Leandro Barbosa. You had Jim Jackson, former Maverick Jim Jackson. You had a young Joe Johnson emerging. This is before he got his big money contract in Atlanta. He was emerging as well. You also have other capable players for them like Quentin Richardson. This is a team that all they really were missing was that elite level point guard and the addition of Steve Nash was exactly what they needed because they had the right coach for them in D'Antoni. They just needed a, a maestro to really run that machine and elevate them out of what had been a borderline playoff team and put them over the top into one of the best teams in the league year in and year out for the next several years. Conversely, the Mavericks roster, and this is where things get a little bit complicated to break down. Had Steve Nash stayed in Dallas, there are several factors to consider here. One, right off the bat, there is no Eric Dampier in Dallas because Eric Dampier, say what you want, he got a seven-year, $73 million contract in a sign-and-trade sign with the Mavericks after Nash left. They never played together. So with that big man presence, you don't have Eric Dampier. Therefore, you never eventually get Tyson Chandler because it was the Eric Dampier trade chip, basically, that allowed you to go get Tyson Chandler from Charlotte. That's years down the road, obviously. Additionally, and this is a much bigger impact in terms of the era of Mavericks basketball that followed Steve Nash and went through until about 2012, that being you don't have Jason Terry. Jason Terry was brought into Dallas as part of a trade with the Hawks, along with Allen Henderson, to basically serve as Steve Nash's replacement. Now, it helped that in 2003, in a game against the Mavericks, Jason Terry dropped a career-high 46 points, and uh, I think later that year posted his first career triple-double as well against Chicago. All of that made him a very cheap and popular option. Now, he, he became a fan favorite immediately, even though he was in an awkward situation having to replace Steve Nash, but he averaged 17 points for the Mavericks and was an exciting player for them. He also was on a great deal. It was his second contract, but he didn't have a big, big rookie contract with the Hawks. He re-signed to a new deal in 2003, became a Maverick in 2004. So Dallas wouldn't effectively have to pay him big money, that coming in the form of a six-year, $50 million contract until 2006. That is substantial when considering this as well. So that's how you basically took the contract and a little more that you wouldn't give to Steve Nash. You gave it instead to Eric Dampier. Again, I know. But then you're also able to then get a solid replacement in Jason Terry in terms of the offensive production. And let's be honest, Nash wasn't a defender anyway, so you're not losing anything on that side. But that's what the picture was. That was the backup plan from Cuban. And I can understand the thinking, but he didn't think Nash had in him what he had in him, which was the best years of his career yet to come. So with that Dallas team, if you don't have Dampier, you don't have Jason Terry. You're probably looking at something along the lines of Dirk and Nash still had Michael Finley. You have a sophomore, Josh Howard and Marquise Daniels. Now, Josh Howard and Nash played together uh, the previous year, but it was, again, Daniels and Howard's rookie season. They hadn't had a chance to emerge yet. Both of them stepped up big in year number two. So if, if you have Nash with those guys, you to some extent, you don't have necessarily the thunderous playmakers or dunkers that you have in Phoenix, but you certainly have athletic slashing guards and guys that can contribute big and that Nash can really help them elevate their game to a height that Terry and Dirk alone could not. So you get more out of them, I think, if you have 
Steve Nash still at the helm. Additionally, and this is where things get really interesting because in the same offseason that Steve Nash left Dallas, you had Anton Jameson traded to the Washington Wizards in exchange for the draft rights to Devin Harris. Now, Devin Harris was a beast for the Mavericks in the 2006 playoff run towards the finals, and there's a lot of question about this, right? Because if you just paid big money to Nash, would you have then invested in Devin Harris? It seems like by acquiring Jason Terry and then drafting effectively Devin Harris, you were essentially trying to get your current option plus your point guard of the future. So would you have then done Devin Harris had you kept Steve Nash? I contend that you would have if you were Mark Cuban because the perception he had is that he viewed Nash as breaking down. He thought he was physically breaking down, but if Nash had had a little bit more left in the tank, which he did, if Cuban had basically seen that and said, you know what, we're going into win it all now mode. We are going to go out of our way to give Nash this contract because we want to keep him here. And he, he's been clear, Dallas did not have to offer more money than Phoenix. They didn't have to offer the same amount of money as Phoenix. They just had to be competitive because Nash was here. He liked it here. He wanted to be here. Cuban declined to give him that offer. So hard to say what that contract looks like. Let's say you're paying a little over three-fourths of what Phoenix is. Let's say instead of five years for $65 million, Dallas offers something along the lines of five years for 50 or 55 more yeah more towards the phoenix number without exceeding it if they do that i think they keep nash but because of cuban's existing concerns about his back at that point and the fact that the anton jameson experiment hadn't worked out in dallas the year before i think he still moves jameson to washington who still wants him and acquires the point guard of the future in devin harris to play behind steve nash so very different look there. So you still would have then during that playoff run the carving up of the Spurs defense and uh, the Suns, which the Suns aren't going to be in that because Nash isn't there. You would still have that possibility with a young Devin Harris. But your team looks drastically different. You still have Jerry Stackhouse. You still have Keith Van Horn. I think you still got a team that it's built different, but I think it's capable of making a run still. We saw in 2002, 2003 in the Western Conference Finals against the San Antonio Spurs, which that was a very slow, grinded out Spurs team, wanted to grind you into the dust. That was not a more offensively potent Spurs team. Um, and if you don't have dirt going down with an MCL sprain in that series, Dallas loses in six. If you don't have that happen, I think they beat them. And then I think they go and beat Jason Kidd's New Jersey Nets in the NBA Finals for Dirk Nash and Finley to win it all in 2003. That doesn't happen, however. And I think in this case, another element that we really have to consider, the whole picture changes. Because if you recall what happened in the following season without without Steve Nash is you had Don Nelson, the Mavericks coach, step down. Mid-season step down, elevated his assistant, former Spurs point guard and NBA champion, Avery Johnson, into the head coach position. Now under Avery Johnson, the Mavericks underwent a drastic identity change. They became much more of a defensive savvy team, ranking towards the top in defensive rating. And that really shaped in 2005 when they got bounced by nash and the suns they were better certainly but it was a mid-season transition so it didn't really work out it was the following year when they went to the finals against the heat where you really saw that defensive identity taking shape now avery ended up not working out in the long term for other reasons but rick carlisle comes in and you know now we're in our current run here point of this being the the straw that broke the camel's back for Don Nelson coaching in Dallas was Steve Nash. That was what he so strongly disagreed with. We know that during that aforementioned Western Conference final series against the Spurs, him and Mark Cuban butted heads on whether or not Dirk should play in game six. Dirk wanted to go, although he now says he, his knee wasn't ready and he kind of worries about what could have happened. You know, maybe it's a Kevin Durant in the NBA finals popping his Achilles tendon after trying to come back. Uh, maybe it's that kind of scenario, and it changes the trajectory of Dirk's career and the franchise as a whole. Hard to say, but young Dirk wanted to play. Mark was very much in favor of him playing, but Don Nelson actually had the sense to say, no, you have such gold here you don't even realize. You need to think long term. 
that was one major clash they had, and I think Cuban held on to that for a little while, it sounds like. After that, what broke the camel's back was letting Steve Nash go in free agency because Don Nelson was basically one of those innovators of high-octane offense, and that is what he what he fully believed in, you know, winningest coach in regular season. Uh, I think he's the winningest coach ever to not have a championship as well at the NBA level, which is kind of crazy. But that's the guy he wanted. That was his floor general, and he bows out in the middle of the next year. So hard to say because immediately your future trajectory of the Mavericks, not just with the addition of Steve Nash and then who that affects player-wise that stays or goes or even possibly comes in, but... It also changes then your trajectory of your entire team's identity because your head coach change doesn't happen. So you have to then consider several other things with, you know, with Don Nelson. If for some reason Nelson had stepped down, would Nash have been able to run and been anywhere near the MVP level he was under Avery Johnson? I don't think he would have been. I think if Don Nelson had stepped down for any other reason, it would have been a disastrous transition there, and I think it would have backfired where they would have had to have blown something up and maybe traded Nash. Thankfully, I don't think that's very likely. I think what would have happened is you would have held on to Don Nelson, and you would have basically kept trying to run teams out of the gym to try and win a championship, which, again, had come damn close in 2002-2003. So in 2004-2005, Steve Nash's first year in Phoenix, they won 62 games. I think that this trajectory, obviously, if Nash isn't on that team, that team's fighting just to try and make the playoffs. And I think in this case, Nash in Dallas, that's a very different picture because that season was the year that the Spurs beat the Pistons in the NBA Finals uh, in a brilliant seven-game series. So if you have that setup in that case then I think Dallas would have a puncher's chance against that Spurs team, but I don't think they necessarily can get over the hump. Dallas would basically have to try and just blitz them with offense, and you're still in that first year with a rookie Devin Harris. You got a better Josh Howard and Marquise Daniels, but I don't think they're over the top yet to deal with the Spurs, who are still a bit of a slower, grind-out defensive team, but you're also dealing with prime Tim Duncan and emerging a mono, uh, mono Ginobili and Tony Parker. And so I think this Spurs team is probably still just a hair more than Dallas can deal with in 2005. Where things get interesting then is 2006. The Suns won 54 games. Again, wiped them off the table. This is the year that you have Mavs versus Heat. This is very interesting here because in the absence of the Suns, your division winner for them, the Pacific Division, is going to be, based on what we see here, the uh, LA Clippers with a 47-win record. Then right behind them, you're going to have the Kings around 44 wins. Those teams elevate a bit, you got to think, in the lack of Nash and Phoenix, just playing within division so many games. They're not taking as many L's. So I think that changes that trajectory a little bit there. But I think those are your contention points. And I don't think that Clippers team was scary at all. Chris Kamen's not exactly scaring me. Sam Cassell, whatever else they were rolling out there at the time. I'm not worried about that Clippers team. And so I think what you end up with is a situation where you still have Devin Harris carving up the Spurs in the second round. Although at that point, you probably don't have the Mavericks where they are because the Mavericks, since they weren't division winners, this is the last year before the playoff format re-racked. Back then, division winners got home court advantage, even if another team had a better record. That's why the Spurs and Mavericks being in the same division hurt them for several years. The Spurs had a better record that year than the Mavericks, and the Mavericks, as a result of that, had to be a lower seed and basically go to the home court of Phoenix in the Western Conference Finals, even though... The Suns had 54 wins compared to 60 wins for the Mavericks. Very drastic flip there, but it is what it is. That was the last year that it was like that. They actually changed the layout of the format for the playoffs because of this series. So with this, assuming that we're still in the same situation with the Spurs and their 63 wins, hosting the Mavericks in the second round, I think the Mavericks get past them. I think the elevation of Dirk this year, this was the first year that Dirk just flat out broke out and you could tell this dude was superstar 
ready at this point. He had already been a star, but this was superstar Dirk bursting through. You still got Nash holding down the fort, probably still posting similar numbers. I don't think Nash is winning MVPs in Dallas because at the very least, I think the attention is a little bit divided off of him. When he went into Phoenix and then turned them around like that and turned them into the perennial offensive power that they were, even though they had Sean Marion and a young emerging Amari Stoudemire beasting out for that team, I think it was pretty clear that Steve Nash had been what was missing, and so his value was never questioned. If he stays in Dallas, I think Dirk and his emergence as clearly the number one guy for Dallas changes that perspective. And so Nash isn't in MVP conversations, but he is an all-star and he is still posting similar numbers, something around 17 to 19 points uh, a game. Like I said, even his couple years, first couple years in Phoenix, he's not posting more. In fact, his first season in Phoenix, he's posting 15 points a game. He's posting 15.5 points per game, 11 and a half assists. 3.3 boards, 50% from the field, 43% from beyond the arc, 88.7% at the stripe, and an effective field goal percentage of 55.7%. That was the previous year. He held similar numbers then the next year. They were, they were a bit better, and that was the justification for him winning a second straight MVP because he was already MVP, and then he elevated his game. But that's just the, that's the perception. I think he's holding similar numbers even in Dallas. Maybe not quite the same on the assist level because he doesn't have the power finisher and the pick and roll ferocious dunker that he had with Amari Stoudemire in Dallas. He doesn't have that type of player in Dallas alongside him, but I think he's probably covering enough of the bases that Dallas is able to still shine. He's still able to play at a high level, and I think that carries them past the Spurs in a, in a classic series. Maybe instead of seven, it's a six-game series for Dallas. And, uh, you know, that series swung anyway to go seven games because of Jason Terry getting suspended for a critical game six. So maybe it's different in that regard uh, automatically. But that's probably about what we're looking at there. The Western Conference Finals then is an interesting matchup because, as I said before, you don't have the Phoenix Suns. So you're probably facing a team that is much easier to deal with. You don't have Shaq in LA, as I said at this point. So the Lakers, they're a playoff team, but they're much more so down. They're a 45 win team this year with Kobe and they lose in the first round, I believe that year to the Suns and Nash. So you're probably instead at this point facing a team like, well, you know, you might have a, you might have a favorable matchup there because you might be facing a team like the Kings or Clippers potentially in that season just based on what you see here you might have that favorable of a matchup in the west finals after going through a grueling battle with the spurs in the second round so if that's the case here you are in the finals you're now dealing with the miami heat this was the breakout series for Dwayne wade this was the breakout moment for a horrific nba officiating and uh could dirk and nash topple wade and um, Shaq. This is where it gets really interesting. So I'll slow things down just a little bit here. In this presentation, I think that the Mavericks probably do beat the Heat. Now, it's a very different identity. Again, your head coach is different too. I still think you have Don Nelson, and I still think because you have Nash, your offensive identity is still run and gun. The Heat... While Shaq was still very good in this season with the Heat, it was so very clear in that series that it it basically in that series, it was like, nope, this is Wade's team. This is his thing. You still have terrible officiating dealing with that. You still have that problem to deal with. But several things kind of went un, unglued for the Mavericks. You had Avery Johnson getting out coached and losing his mind. I don't think Don Nelson would have that problem. Uh, you have a situation, granted he's going against Pat Riley, so it's certainly, you can't rule out the possibility of that, but I think it's a different, I think it's a different projection at that point if you have, if you have Nash. I think you have a steadier hand at the point guard than you had with Jet. Jet had a great first game in that series, 32 points I want to say, but was ho-hum the rest of the way for the most part. Uh, I think Dallas came unglued at the seams. I think a lot of that had to do with the fact that Avery Johnson was breaking down and losing his mind, getting superstitious and making the team change hotels the night before a critical, I think, game five in that series. 
And I, I think that radiated through the team and kind of shook them a little bit as well based on how the momentum had changed. I think if you have a run-and-gun style, I don't think that Shaq can keep up with that. So I think you can neutralize Shaq going small ball in that case. And you still have Dirk playing great basketball in, in that series. You have more firepower in the form of, you know, Josh Howard was great in that seat in that seat series. Uh, and that entire playoff run in general that year, I think the Mavericks in games in which he scored at least 20 points that season had one loss on the entire year, and it came in that NBA Finals matchup with the Heat. It was something like, I don't remember the number, but I remember the first loss occurred in the Finals against the Heat. So is he still posting those same numbers if you have Nash? I think so, because I think Nash and Terry's numbers were pretty comparable as far as points per game and shot attempts and things like that. I just think that Nash is better at getting guys into their spot. So I think Dallas probably has the firepower and the up-tempo pace, whereas Avery Johnson, because of coming out of the Greg Popovich system in 99, uh, he was more of a slow things down and kind of play within sets. I think Nelson was more up and down the court, keep it going, keep rhythm. And I think that would have played better. So I think Dallas... Based on what we can what we can ascertain, I think Dallas has enough that they get past the Heat in 2006 for a championship. Now, who is to say? Because we saw how the officiating of that series went. The series isn't rigged, but it is incredibly partial towards the Heat on free throw attempts. Obviously, game three through six, games three through six, Wade, I think, by himself shot more free throws than the Mavericks as a team. It was like that insane. But with this setup as is, assuming it doesn't skew even more uh, improbably in favor of the Heat in that regard, I think Dallas just had more they could offer. Because at that point, you're talking about a Jason Williams white chocolate point guard. You're talking about Anton Antoine Walker uh, as your power forward. You got an older Gary Payton who, yes, he hits a game-winning shot in this series, I want to say in game three. But it's just it's a different feel for the series overall. And I think Dallas has more firepower and tempo that Miami's veterans would not have been as well-equipped to handle. Now we're going to get into 2007. What was supposed to be and looked for all intents and purposes to be the revenge tour. A lot changes here as well. The Mavericks that year with Dirk winning the MVP, they post 67 wins. They are the number one overall seed in the NBA and they famously lose in the first round to Don Nelson, who now he is still the Mavericks coach in this scenario. But Don Nelson and the uh, Don Nelson and the We Believe Golden State Warriors, Baron Davis, Matt Barnes, Young Monte Ellis, just a crazy Jason Richardson, just a very talented upstart run and gun team that I think now they're not there because you don't have Don Nelson, so you don't have them getting the leaning into the style of play with someone as adept at coaching that style of play as you have with Nelson. And so that doesn't happen. Dallas probably posts something like 70 wins that year. I think Nash probably is the difference to get you two or three more games in that regard, although Jet was great in that year as well. And Josh Howard made his first and only all-star team that year as well. I think in that case, you have a 70-win Dallas team on a collision course for the um, for the San Antonio Spurs because that next year is another Spurs championship. So the Western Conference Finals is going to be another brilliant series. If Dallas gets past that Spurs team, then they're facing LeBron James, uh, very young LeBron James, and the Cleveland Cavaliers. And that is a team that the Spurs swept in the series. Am I saying Dallas sweeps this Cavaliers team? Not necessarily, but I think if Dallas gets past the Spurs in the West Finals, I think they're handily beating the Cavaliers because LeBron was really the only thing they had on that team. And just like the Spurs did, they basically said, hey, this guy's gonna drop 30 or 35 in a game. Great. You're the only one that we're gonna let do anything because you by yourself will not be enough to beat us for 48 minutes. 
And that's basically how the Spurs handled them. They swept them easily. I think Dallas probably beats the Cavaliers in, I'm going to say, five games. I'll, I'll give the, since the Spurs were still a very much defensive-minded team, uh, and Dallas, obviously, as we said earlier, is not playing that, I'm willing to concede Dallas probably loses a game in there. But just like that, we got back-to-back -back titles in this scenario, potentially. At least one, and possibly two. Although you could certainly make the argument and counter based on other outside factors and what-ifs of them getting there but not winning it. Fine. But regardless, the success is higher than the team enjoyed in, in reality with what actually happened. The next year is an interesting year as well. Speaking of moves that don't happen, you don't have Jason Kidd being acquired at the deadline to come to Dallas and play with Dirk. That is a huge move. Steve Nash actually in his last year in Dallas in 2004 actually was kind of offended because there was a lot of trade speculation before the deadline that year of Dallas possibly trying to go get Kidd in favor of Nash. Now Kidd had already or Nash had already backed up Kidd initially in Phoenix when he was drafted by the Suns and he was offended basically that even though Kidd was still at like the height of his powers, he didn't like the idea that he, who felt like he was still a very good point guard, one of the better point guards in the league, was being looked over for a kid. And that's understandable. You already had six years of service in Dallas. You'd already had multiple all-star appearances. And you had taken the team to the Western Conference Finals. You're going to take some offense to that. I understand that. But in this scenario, without the kid trade happening, you have that year Dallas is a seven seed. Still wins 50 games. I think 51 games. But they're a seven seed, and they get bounced by a young Chris Paul, Tyson Chandler, David West, New Orleans Hornets team. So in this scenario, a lot changes here. This is the year where the Lakers are back. You have now, you have the Boston Big Three with Pierce, Allen, and Garnett. And the other window over here, you have the Lakers who are back because they've done the Pau Gasol trade. They have Phil Jackson back out of retirement. This is the start of real war. And I'll be honest with you guys, I don't think Dallas at this point can deal with getting through both of these teams. The Spurs are still a damn good team. Uh, you have the Lakers who are back. You have the Celtics. I don't think Dallas has the firepower to get through this gauntlet at this point. Where they end up, they probably lose in the second round depending on how their seeding works out. But they're probably getting beat by the Spurs or Lakers, whoever they match up with in that second round or if by chance they get by one of them they're probably then losing to the next one in the western conference finals so as interesting as it would be it would have been to see a dirk versus kg nba finals one just because that is such a popular debate among fans um i don't think we would have gotten that i don't think they get through both just like in 2011 as great as that team was they didn't really become the team of destiny until the western conference finals that year and you know, even then, you had the break of the Spurs as a one seed getting bounced by the eight seeded Grizzlies that year. So that's a different kind of presentation uh, in that regard. So I don't know that they could have gotten past the Spurs and Lakers that year before then having to deal with the Heat. So the fact that the, the Spurs got bounced and it allowed OKC then to get into the West Finals, a young, inexperienced OKC team with a not so great coach in Scott Brooks who Carlisle was able to out coach. And, you know, the vet veteran experience played a huge role in that series, too. I think that was everything Dallas needed. They went in five. They give themselves some time to rest up and recoup and, you know, just kind of build that sense of confidence as well. So in 2008, I don't think they can do that. I think they get tripped up and fall in the middle, uh, middle of the playoff run there. 2009 is another interesting year for Dallas. They beat the Spurs in the first round before then losing in the second round to the Denver Nuggets. That's Chauncey Billups. That's Carmelo Anthony. That's Kenyon Martin. That is, a, that is a very good Denver team. They get to the Western Conference Finals that year in 2009 before um, getting beat there. So with that, you have then the Lakers probably winning their championship. I think Boston, obviously, because of the scenario I laid out earlier. I think you have the Celtics winning the year before in 2008. I think the Lakers then get him back, or rather got back Dwight Howard and the Magic in 09. Lakers then in 2010. How do they do? That's where we get that's where the conversation gets interesting, right? Because 
in this projection, I've been laying out basically as if Nash never left Dallas, but really what I'm doing is running through it at the very least the time he spent with Phoenix after leaving Dallas. 2010, it's hard to say. I think that was still a very good Lakers team. Uh, obviously, they went to three straight NBA finals during all of that. Uh, Pau Gasol was a beast for them. They still had quality veterans like Derek Fisher, hated Maverick, Derek Fisher. Andrew Bynum actually looked like he was worth a damn for about a five-minute span. And Lamar Odom, of course, reigning sixth man of the year from that season as well. So I think that year, you probably have a scenario where the Lakers, they probably do repeat. They probably do. I think they were a very, very good team that season. What I wanna, what I really want to know is what happens after that. I don't think it's impossible to project like the butterfly effect beyond this of saying like, hey, so-and-so is a free agent now and this is the landscape of the NBA so he chooses to go here or he chooses to come to Dallas. It's incredibly difficult to say and it's it's pure speculation. So projecting really beyond 2008 or 2009 is really tough to do. All I can really tell you is that the Lakers won it again in 2010. I think that Lakers team is better than the Mavericks. Again, if they're having to go through a gauntlet of the Lakers and Spurs, I think that Lakers team probably repeats like they did. 2011 now looks different because now you have the super team in Miami. Dallas never acquires, or maybe they do through a different means. Uh, Tyson Chandler, perhaps they take a, a stab at him differently, but really, just like the Mavericks in real life, became aware, like Jason Terry landed on the Mavericks radar because of that 46 point game he dropped on them in 2003 with the Hawks. Tyson Chandler dropped on the Mavericks radar because of that 2008 playoff series. Now, the Mavericks were a seven seed and the Hornets were a two seed that year. So how does that work out? You know, with Nash, is Dallas still a seven seed that year? I don't think so. Phoenix was a better team than Dallas was that year. So I tend to think that, you know, even though Phoenix had Shaq, that trade now never happened. So where's Shaq in this whole thing? Uh, how, how does this shake out? And how does it go? Dallas never gets that experience where they firsthand watch Tyson Chandler beat up on them. And so then they put a, a note by his name, like, mm, keep an eye on this guy and see if we can get him down the road. Maybe they do that still because he styles on someone else. I don't know. If Tyson Chandler, probably not in Dallas in 2011, and you don't have Jason Kidd, I don't think you get past the LeBron Wade Bosch heat. I don't. I, I think the West is still an animal because Phoenix by 2011, Phoenix is off the radar. Their last hoo-ha was 2010 where they faced off with the Lakers and lost in the Western Conference Finals there. That was their last run. I don't think that happens with, um, with that because Nash is in clear decline at this point. Still, still very good. Still good, a good point guard, but he's in clear decline. And even though Dirk is you know Dirk at this point is probably around 33 32 33 years old so I don't think this Mavericks team has the the staunch defensive minded veterans they needed maybe you know maybe some of these guys organically find their way back but that 2011 team was just such a perfect chemistry meshing of personalities with your defensive minded um, players your nice bit players who you send them elsewhere and it's not going to make any kind of waves, but all together in the, the unit that they formed were great. And he even had a little bit of the crazy to him as well. Every team really needs that one guy who's a little unstable, a little crazy, but you like having him on your team as opposed to against you. For the Mavericks in 2011, that was Deshaun Stevenson. Now, Josh Howard got traded to the Washington Wizards as well in a deal in 2010 that brought in Karan Butler and... Um, Brendan Haywood and Deshaun Stevenson. Perhaps that trade still happens because obviously Howard in Dallas is not affected by Nash staying. So maybe you still have that. And now maybe you have a unit of Dirk, Nash, and Karan Butler um, here. Because you never had to trade Devin Harris for Jason Kidd, maybe you still have Devin Harris. But if you do, that's, a, that's iffy to me because would Devin Harris have wanted to stay on a new deal still behind Nash in Dallas? I don't know. 
He went and briefly thrived for about a year and a half with the Nets before kind of falling back from all-star level to, you know, just a, a steady hand NBA bench player. So it's interesting to kind of project that. What would that 2011 Mavericks team have looked like? It's incredibly difficult to project only because it's a, everything's a butterfly effect. One slight tweak here could rearrange the entire landscape just on a cause and effect basis. So I don't know, but I, I'm going to say that if Steve Nash had stayed in Dallas, I'm not even going to bother projecting out his last couple years in the league. Um, I think he was with Phoenix one more year and then went to the Lakers from there. No, he went to the Lakers the next year after Dirk won the championship. He went to the Lakers, I believe, for two years, whatever. I'm not even going to worry about projecting that out. Maybe Nash does leave Dirk and the Mavericks at that point because if he kept that deal in 2000, a five-year deal in 2004, that would have carried him through 2009 um, that season. If he had the same deal that Phoenix gave with a team option, Perhaps you keep him a little longer. But at this point, we're beyond that. He would have had to have signed a new deal to stay here. And I don't know that Cuban would have done that. I think Cuban might have considered saying, okay, you know, we won a couple rings with Nash. We've still been competitive and relevant, but now it's probably time to move on. And I think he would have handed the keys over to Devin Harris, perhaps, if he's still here, or they would have done something different. So very tough to say, but I think if Steve Nash does not leave Dallas, does not leave Dirk. Perhaps, you know, they've both argued that for them to reach their greatest individual heights, they had to be separated. But together, could they have reached higher heights than they did separately? Separately, they won one championship between them. Nash won two MVPs. Dirk won an MVP. They don't win as many MVPs, but I think they win more championships. Instead of three MVPs between them, I think you probably get just Dirk's one. I think that they win two championships in six and seven 2006 2007 seasons i think they win a couple championships and i think they remain competitive but not necessarily over the top and it's hard to project too far beyond that because at that point there's been too much time and too much movement around the league in terms of transactions trades signings things of that nature to really project out beyond clear speculation or just running a simulation which obviously a simulation is a possibility, but it's not a, an inaccurate, likely reality. So that's that pretty much wraps it up. I think if Nash doesn't leave Dallas, the entire perception of this franchise is different. But I think Don Nelson, you know, I talked before about Don Nelson in my hypothetical being with the team through maybe 2008, 2009. He coached beyond that he coached till i think about 2009 2010 i think he was around that time nearing the handoff point but then you know what's your handoff point look like at that point because rick carlisle came in in 2008 with the mavericks he came in middle of the year i believe after after avery johnson was let go the year following the hornet series if i recall correctly so if that's the case then you probably miss out on Rick Carlisle, who's now been your coach for like 11 or 12 years. And that's a very different feeling as well when you weigh this franchise and how it could affect the current roster where you're looking at Luka Doncic and Kristaps Porzingis um, and all these you know great players that they have now and just how the future looks now. It's very difficult to see that because of butterfly effect. But... This is a fun and very complex what if, even as much as I've laid out and the different elements I've considered, I am damn certain I've missed several elements in the midst of all of this. But let's just say I think this is a I think this is a team that would have made continued to make noise for several years. And I think they probably do win a couple of championships right there in that sweet spot during Nash's peak years right when he first got to Phoenix. His early 30s, I think he puts up big numbers still with Dallas. Maybe not as high in terms of his assist numbers, but I think it's enough for them to get over the hump and possibly even repeat as champions the following year. But that's all my time for this video, guys. If you like this, don't forget to drop a like, leave a comment below, subscribe to the Dallas Prospect, buy the t-shirts on represent.com, and until next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect. Peace.